I'm excited about this sermon this morning. It's finishing up talking about the goodness of God, living in the land of God's goodness. God is good. God is great. And, you know, I just think that God's got something for us today as we talk about two ways of looking at life. So if you want to pull out your sermon notes with me, let's look at that together. I think there are two different mindsets that explain how different people approach life. And they're night and day. They're so very different. I want you to see where you are in this, okay? The first I call the scarcity mindset. The scarcity mindset. You might want to put that down there. There's not enough to go around. There's, there's only so much. And if you get something, then that's just that much less for me. And so it causes competition. It causes envy and jealousy. And in the Bible, the words are lacking, needing, um, wanting. This shortage, scarcity kind of, of mindset. It's always a competition. You know, life is like a pie is how this mindset works. And if you get a bigger slice of the pie, that just leaves that much less for me. I, I, I've noticed it a lot when we are talking about the wealthy in our country today. And um, I was reading an article just this week on Jeff Bezos. He's worth $150 billion. Can you believe that? You know, you're going, how did that happen? I think that I contributed a lot to that with my Amazon account, you know, but... Um, Probably you did too. So you go, no one should have that much money. And you're going like, I want this on Amazon though, right? Um, but it was saying that that's just obscene in this article. And I was thinking, well, we're the ones that got him there, right? And um, the fact that Jeff Bezos has $150 billion, how does that affect you today? Does that, you know, because I hope he uses 140 billion of it, gives it out around the globe to do good things. That would be awesome. Jeff Bezos, if you're listening, I'm pretty sure you're online listening right now. Um, but how does that affect you? I mean, did your employer come and go like, I really want to give you a raise, but you know, Jeff Bezos, he's got $150 billion. Don't have, no, unless your name's Barnes or Noble, it probably didn't affect you, right? So we, but we get this idea that, wow, if they get this, I can't have this and you know, and, and, and everybody's fighting this kind of thing. That's the scarcity mindset. The Bible isn't into that. What the Bible talks about is the abundance mindset. The abundance mindset. God has more than I'll ever need and he'll never run out. In fact, life is not a pie. God makes pies. And he can give you a whole pie if he wants to, right? And there's plenty to go around. A good example of that is, let me just ask you this question. How many of you have been sitting here thinking this morning, like during the music and stuff, the person next to me is using up a lot of my air? <laughs> have you thought that? I mean, is that what you're, I mean, have you been thinking that? Like, you know, uh, whew, they're breathing really deep, they're singing really loud. I mean, whew, I'm feeling like a little lack of, well, may, I, I doubt that is happening because God has provided air. There's air for us. There's plenty for all of us. And that's what he wants us to begin to, to turn our mindsets around so that we don't feel like that anybody owes us anything. That we can look to God and he's going to meet our needs and he's going to do what he wants to do in our life. The psalmist put it like this, and this is where we are today as we've been going through Psalm 23 and seeing how good God is, David comes to the verse and he goes, my cup overflows. My cup overflows. What's he talking about? He's talking about an overflowing life. It's interesting. He starts Psalm 23 by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. I have everything that I need. But then he goes a whole step further in verse 5, and he says, not only do I have everything that I need, but my cup overflows. I have more than I need. I, I mean, it just runs over. Jesus, 2,000 years after David 
wrote this psalm in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. There was this big feast. And on the great day of the feast, there's about 50,000 people worshiping in this big Jewish feast. And Jesus stands up on the, the last day. And look what it says in, in John 7, 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. What's he saying? He's saying the same thing David said. Your cup's going to overflow. There's rivers. Imagine just like a river of living water flowing out from you. Anybody who believes in me, and it's a really interesting word there for believes in the original language, the Greek of the New Testament, pistuo, pistuo. It's a lot more than what we say when we say we believe. Let me just give you a real quick example. This little stool right here. The American way of saying believe is going like, that stool, it looks sturdy. I believe it's going to hold me up. And we just kind of stop there, right? I believe that. Believe that with all my heart. Then we'll walk off. But here's the thing. In the Greek, what pistuo means, it means I believe in this stool. I put all my weight on it. I lean into it. Everything that I have, I, I bank on it. Because if it, I'm going to fall flat on my rear end if, it, if that's not true, right? And that's what it means to believe in Jesus. He says anyone who believes in me like this, rivers of living water will, will flow out. You're depending on me. We've been looking at the goodness of God for weeks now. How good he is. But I, I want you to realize this. After all of this time, here's something we've got to know. Any time you doubt the goodness of God, that God is good, you're going to get into trouble. Anytime you doubt his goodness in your life, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to begin to worry. You're going to begin to have issues and problems. Even the tough stuff, God doesn't he, he doesn't do bad things, but he still, he's sovereign, right? We, we, we learned how, how bad things come into our life because we live on this broken planet, this sinful planet, this prodigal planet that's gotten away from God's original plan, but he still allows those things into our lives. Nothing can come into our lives as believers except that it comes through those loving fingers of God because he's got his hands around us. He surrounded us. And even the tough stuff in my life, God wants to make it good. You wonder how he can do that sometimes. And so do I. But listen to what Isaiah 48, 17 and 18 says. Jesus talking about his goodness. I am the holy Lord God, the one who rescues you. For your own good, I teach you. And I lead you along the right path. And then there's regret in God's voice suddenly. Have you ever heard God speak in regret? Listen to this. How I wish that you had obeyed my commands. Your success and good fortune would then have overflowed like a flooding river. He's talking about the overflowing life again. For your own good, I teach you. I, not to make life tough on you. I didn't put these principles down in my word so, so that, you know, you could be on some kind of performance-based acceptance and I love you if you... No, I love you. I just love you. And I'm good toward you, my little son, my little daughter. Those principles are there because I love you. Oh, how I wish... Oh, how I wish you would have obeyed my commands. When it comes to how to treat your body, when it comes to how to treat sex, when it comes to how to treat your money and, and your reputation and all the things that we deal with in life, if only, you ever hear, if only, did you know God wants you to succeed in an overflowing way? That God wants your life to overflow with 
with fortune and success. Everybody wants to be a success. And God says, if only you would have observed my commands, it would be like that for you. Where does success come from? Not from some self-help program. It comes from obeying God's principles and God's word. So listen to this. Any time I disobey God, God says, do it this way. And I say, I think I'm going to do it that way. Really, what we're doing is we're doubting the goodness of God. I don't really know, God, that you have my best interest at heart. You see, I feel like this is the way I want to go. This is the way I need to go. Uh, This is the way I feel like I should go. And God's going, but here's my principle, and you're violating it. Well, this, God, I'm not sure about your principle, really. And he goes, oh, there you go again. If only... Some of you are saying, I wish that I was successful. I wish that, I, why, why, why is this not true for me? God's going, if only. So it, it, it's such a, a regret for God. The overflowing life. I want you to just write this definition down. The overflowing life is actually simply to be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. We've been talking about how good he is. He, he, he's good. There's no being in the universe more good, more generous than God. To be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. Anytime you disobey, you're saying, God, I'm just not really sure you're good. Really, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Well, how do I experience this this overflowing life? I think there's four daily habits that you, if you will do these habits, you will experience God's overflow in your life. The Bible teaches it as I've gone through and, and pulled from different places. How can I experience an overflowing life? The first one, are you ready? And they get progressively harder, but these are, these are the, the principles. Number one, stay connected to Jesus every day. Stay connected to Jesus every day. You've got to stay connected to him every day. In John chapter 15, Jesus compares our relationship with him with that of a grapevine. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. And then listen to what he says in verse seven. If you stay in me, if you stay connected to me and obey my commands, you may ask any request you like. And it will be granted. My true disciples produce bountiful harvests. This brings great glory to my Father. I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Live within my love. When you obey me, you're living in my love. Just as I obey my Father and live in his love. I've told you this so that you will be filled with joy. But not just filled. Yes, your joy, your cup of joy will over flow he's saying if you go through life depending on yourself and your own power you're going to probably live an overwhelmed life I want an overflowing life for you if you're plugged into Jesus you're going to have power how do you stay connected how do you do that well you have to spend some time with him every day every day when you get up in the morning and you, you maybe get up five, ten minutes early so you can read a little of his word. Pull out the Bible. I like to use my iPad because I can look up scripture on that. You know, there's Bible Gateway it is a good, uh, one of the, the places that you can go to. And you can find scripture in all different translations. All of them pretty good, pretty accurate into the English from the Hebrew and the Greek. And, and, and I would recommend just read a a psalm or two and maybe a proverb one of the chapters of proverbs there's 31 chapters in proverbs and you could do that for one day for a month for the the whole month and you begin to just say god speak to me out of your word and psalms it's just like prayers to god proverbs are like almost like god just talking to you through one of the wisest men who ever lived on the planet solomon and Begin to do that. Then just talk to God yourself. That's called prayer. 
It doesn't have to be some two-hour thing, you know. But in the morning when you wake up, it changes the whole day if you start that way. Now, some of you wake up and you go, good morning, Lord. And some of you wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning, right? So if this is just really hard for you in the morning, do it at night. The reason why I don't like it at night because we get all these kinds of things and we get, you know, start putting things off, getting things done, and then ready to just go to bed and it, we're too, almost too tired to do it. But if that's when it's your time, then do that. Then some of you who have small children, maybe you have to put them down and then spend a few minutes with God. You can either do that or, you know, watch HGTV or God is going to be a lot better if you're connected to Jesus, you know? So you notice the promise. He says you can request whatever you like and it'll be granted. That's, that's an amazing thing to say. You say, wow, my prayers aren't answered like that. Well, are you connected? Are you obeying? Did you see the prerequisites for that? And then he begins to put these desires in your heart and, and they're his desires and you ask for them and they just, wow, and you just start seeing your prayers answered like crazy. Now let me give you a second key and these are getting a little harder each time. So number two, what the Bible teaches to have an overflowing life, stop complaining and start being grateful. Stop complaining and start being grateful. Now, that's hard. That's, that's, hard for, that's hard for me. Someone asked Laura, do you wake up grouchy in the morning? She said, usually I just let him sleep. <laughs> we, we have this tendency, don't we, just to want to whine and complain and gripe. Did you know that science has proven what the Bible teaches? that each of these uh, attitudes actually affects your health. Complaining is very detrimental to your health. Griping is unhealthy, but gratitude in study after study ha has been shown to be the healthiest emotion. You wanna be healthy, learn gratitude. It actually changes the chemistry of your brain. Studies have shown that when you're thankful, you're grateful, it produces serotonin, which is a, a feel-good hormone from your brain. It's the same thing that, that when you take Prozac, it tries to hold more serotonin in your brain. Being grateful can be a, a kind of a natural, one of those. It, it, it produces dopamine in your brain, another one of those feel-good. It produces oxytocin in your brain. When you're grateful, now don't misunderstand, not oxycotton, okay? It's oxytocin, okay? Some of you got real excited there for a second. So, um, oxytocin is that feel-good hormone. When a husband and wife make love, oxytocin is released in the husband at least. And then <laughs> when a mother nurses her baby, oxytocin is released in, in both of them. When you pet a dog, did you know this? For 30 minutes, oxytocin is released both in the dog and in you. When you pet a cat for three days, nothing happens. <laughs> the studies are pretty accurate. You want this hormone, this chemical in your life. So what would happen if you got up in the morning and before you got out of bed, you began to name off things that you're grateful for? What if you had a little list and you wrote down 10 things every morning that you're grateful for? it would begin to change your whole day. Did you know they actually even did a study where they asked people to write down 10 things they're grateful for when they first get out of bed and they were checking their hormones, their brain hormones, and even people who were having, a, their life was terrible, and they sat there and they couldn't think of one thing to be grateful for. The act of trying to be grateful released some hormones. Did you know that? So that's how powerful it is. Philippians 2.14 says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Why? Because that's the exact opposite of gratitude. How does it help you when you complain? When you complain about the weather, you know, oh, why don't we have this weather? Why can't we just have Southern California? Does it, does it just, you walk out and you go like, wow, it feels like LA. I complain about the weather and everything changed. No, it doesn't do that. So it's just a total waste of time. Start your day 
with gratitude. The Bible also says, no matter what happens, always be thankful. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. People come to me all the time, I just wish I could know God's will. I've got it right here. I see it right here. God's will. Be thankful. No matter what happens, be thankful. No, I mean, I was talking about for a job. Well, let's start here, and then we can go from there. Some of us haven't even got to the first step. God said, this is the first step in my will. Be thankful. So that's what he wants us to do. There's another thing. Number three, and I'm telling you, it gets harder. Here it is. Stop comparing and start being content. Stop comparing yourself to other people and start being content. Proverbs 14.30, it's healthy to be content, but envy will eat you up. You see, all of us, we're trying to figure, how do I feel good about myself? And what God intended was that first thing, that we would be connected to him, we would be looking to him, and we would know how much he loves us, and we would see ourselves through his eyes, and we would be content in how he made us. But that's not what we do. We all live in the land of Ur. You shouldn't call this America. It should be Ur, right? Because we're always, I look to my right, and I look and, and say, am I rich Ur? Am I smart Ur than these people over here? Am I, look to my left, am, you know, am I more Ur? I, you're pretty good out, you're pretty good, but I've got a little more Ur than you, so I feel pretty good about myself, you know, and, and, and when you're doing that, we do that to our spouses the same way. We say, well, I'm just trying to help them reach their full potential. No, you're trying to be more err. My spouse is more err than your girl. You got a lot more err going on, right? And, and, and we do it to our kids, and it's terrible around here with all the stuff. You know, my kid is... You know, he's playing club sports, and he's like three levels up from every, well, my kid, I, I don't know what to say. You know, you come up with something, right? And, and we live in this society where it, it, it's, it's worse to compare. It's worse than it's ever been, ever, because social media, we have all the Instagram and, and all the stuff we're doing all the time, and, 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 you know, so like you always like, here I am with my Mocha, frappuccino, cappuccino, macchina, you know, and you probably don't have one of those. And then so you run out and go like, well, here I am with my frappuccino, copuccino, al pacino. I don't know. You know, it's like I've got, I bet you don't have one. of. And, and you, it's ridiculous how we do. And the ones that I hate the worst, you know, are the ones that are the spiritual ones. You see the spiritual Instagrams? Here I am worshiping God right now. Just me and God. But who took the picture? You did. What? You know, here I am highlighting my Bible and my time alone with God for my million followers. What? You know. So we, we do this, this kind of thing. And, and God says, don't do it. It's going to eat you up. Because really only one of two things can happen. I'm going to look out there and I'm going to see someone that has more err than me. You know, they're rich er, skinny er, which is hard to believe, I know, but it's, it, it, and, and I'm gonna feel bad about myself, you know? I mean, one of these days I'm gonna look out, I, I'm sure it's gonna happen, one of these days I'm gonna find someone handsomer than me and I'll feel bad. <laughs> you guys just go right along with me, I love that, so. <laughs> or I've got more er and I get proud. So I'm either discouraged or proud, right? I may be nerdy, but you're nerdy-er, right? And, and, and so I've, and we look at that, and that's, that's what we do. And, and there's no win in comparison. There's no win in comparison. And we do this all the time. When a little kid, three years old, my little granddaughter Zoe, you know, she's always saying, she's supposed to call me Poppy, but it came out Babu, okay, when she was little. So now I'm Babu, not only to her, but to all my kids. And now some of you are already starting to call me Babu. Hey, Pastor Babu, you know. And, and 
So anyway, she'll go, Babu, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. When you're three, that's so cute. When you're 30, not so much, right? So we, we do this thing. And listen to what the Bible says. This is amazing. In Ecclesiastes 4, 6, Solomon, again, the wisest man who ever lived, he said, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Let me read it again. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. The Hebrew imagery is amazing here. What he's basically saying is, okay, God, you've blessed me and I've got all of this. I've got a big handful of what the world offers, what you've given me, these amazing blessings. But my other hand's just open to you. And, and you can put into it, you can take out of it. And I've got, a, this, is a, this is the enough hand. But what most of us do, we have two hands. Oh, we've got both. We've got both. I've got getting, I've got to get, and I, I wish I could get more, but I ran out of hands, you know? And, and we're just trying to get more and more. And you're chasing after the wind. Because you talk to even Jeff Bezos with 150 billion. How much is enough? He's probably going to say, just a little more. You see, it never satisfies. So, let me ask you these questions. If you're looking to the left, looking to the right, where are you looking to feel okay? Who are you looking at? You can tell that by saying, are you exhausted from trying to keep up with who? Are you broke from trying to keep up with who? Are you allowing others to keep you from enjoying what you have you know you loved your house it's got 10 foot ceilings and you went to your neighbor's house and they have 12 foot ceilings and now you don't like your house anymore right and it feels like you have to duck now when you come in <laughs> that's what is that are you enjoying your kids or are you driving them crazy with er if you could just be er what about your husband or wife do they they feel like you're dissatisfied with them because of this er thing. Now you don't do it right up front. I mean, because you know, ladies, no husband ever has responded and said, oh honey, you're right, he does make more money than me. I'm gonna work on that right now, right? Or no wife responds, she is a lot thinner than me. Thank you for showing me that. I'm gonna work on this, right? All right? So we, get off, we gotta get off this treadmill. Let me ask you one last question. Who? Who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail? You know, that's one reason why we sell so many, you know, magazines about the rich and famous, because they fail a lot. <laughs> so fun to watch them fail. That's ugly, isn't it? It's just ugly. But you know, well, his kid didn't get into that elite school, and so you're talking on the phone, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> ugly right but we do this that's just sin that's what it is because I have two fists I'm grabbing I'm holding can't be a sincere follower of Jesus and chase the wind at the same time one last thing the hardest one stop being stingy and start being generous stop being stingy and start being generous if you want to move from overwhelmed to overflowing this is a big one why because God says little boy I want you to be like me and I'm the most generous being in the universe God so loved he gave little daughter of mine I want you to be like me now some of you already bunched up I'm not just talking about money you know we have this really sensitive nerve in our body it, it goes straight from our heart to our wallet have you noticed that and it's like Oh, he said, he talk, he's going to talk about giving or something, right? But here's the thing. God says, hey, I need you to learn this. I want you to learn this. God so loved the world he gave. And when I'm afraid to give away, it means I don't understand how God wired the universe. Because he wired it so that as I give under him, he gives back. And he gives back. And he gives back. And it just keeps coming back. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly shall also reap 
sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one of you give as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, listen to this part, to make all grace overflow to you so that by always having enough of everything, you may, what, overflow in every good work. Some of you are going like, oh, you know, I just wish I had some money to give to that. Why don't you have money to give to that? Because you're not doing this. You see, you can't overflow to that good work and this good work and these things that God's doing and what he wants to do because you haven't been doing it. And so if I had 200 kernels of corn and, and I, I said, okay, I've got to live on this next year, so I'm going to hold back 199. I'm just going to plant one because I'm really going to need these. How's that going to go for me? Not too well, is it? Because when you plant them all, what happens? It's abundant. That's what God intended. But a lot of us are, you know, we're, we're holding on to that. We're saying, I'm going to have to hold it. God says you'll overflow. Every time I give, and it, it's true of compliments. It, it, it's true of just sharing your time. You say, there's only so much time. I know that. But it's almost like God just expands your, as you share it with others in need. It's like it expands somehow. In your money, Laura and I have trusted God and played this game with God for years where we say, okay, Mark, I've given to you. Now, God, I'm going to give back to you more, and he gives to me more, and I give more, and he gives more, and, I, and it just is, you can't outgive God. You never, you never can. That's just the way it is. God just does this amazing thing. There's a, there's a principle in the Old Testament called the tithe. And you see Jesus talk about it. So I think it's in the New Testament too. That's giving 10% of your income to your local church. 10% of what God has blessed you with, you give. And you, well, that seems like a lot. And, and I know a lot of people go, well, I don't know if that's New Testament. In the New Testament, it said they gave everything they had. And when I tell them that, then they say, let's go Old Testament on this one. You know, that's probably pretty good. I dare you to try it and see what God does. But don't do it under compulsion. That's why I'm just saying I dare you to try it. I, I, I long for you to try it. God longs for you to try it. But when somebody comes and they try to put a thumb down on you and they try to make you feel guilty or they, they come and they show you, you know, their little pictures and all the kids with the flies and the, all the stuff and the ribs and the, you know, and, and they're going like, please, please. And you just, it says don't give under compulsion. It doesn't count. If somebody comes to your door and tries to put a guilt trip on you, you say, my pastor, Mark Shook at Community of Faith, told me not to give you a dime. That helps my reputation in the community a whole lot. But, you know, it's like if they're, if they're guilt tripping you, God loves a cheerful giver. How can you be cheerful? You believe he's good. Do you believe it or not? One of the ways we really see it is, is in our giving because that's what, God, I believe you're good. I believe what you say is true. I, 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 how I wish. For some of you, you don't even know where you would be financially. If you could hear God right now, he would go, oh, little girl. How I wish that all those years ago, you would have started doing this. You don't even know what I wanted to do. But you had it all so tight and held up. You never have gotten to see it. You don't even have a clue where you would be right now. You see the regret in God's voice? One of the things I dream for you as your pastor is that when we get to heaven, the Bible says, for those who have followed him, full out, obeyed, and walked in his principles, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. He didn't say enter into joy, did he? He said enter into my joy. We don't even know what that is. Every once in a while when we're worshiping, I get a small taste of 
God's joy as he's just rejoicing in his children, praising him. You can kind of feel it just for a moment. That's a taste of heaven. Enter into my joy. That's what I want him to say. I don't want him to say this to you. Oh, you're coming into heaven. That's great. And I love that you're here, little girl, little boy. I'm just so, I'm so glad to have you in my eternal home because you stepped into this relationship with me. But oh, how I wish. No, well done, good and faithful servant. As we do these four things, we're going to hear that. You don't even have a clue what a good God wants to do in your life yet. Not a clue, unless you've been living this. And there's a few of you that have, and I've watched you, and it's amazing the overflow in every area. Most of us... In one or two of these, we're doing okay, and others, we're not so much, okay? But if we do these four things, so you wrote them down, take them home, let's begin to practice them.